Welcome to the 2400 Block Podcast with your hosts, Johnny Rubes and Ken. Podcast spin, intelligence binge watch. Johnny Rubes with the wisdom, never botch. Dark thoughts, ventilate, handy, great knowledge. 2400 crew, like gripping college. Clever minds unite, discussions land tight. Sync up thoughts, intertwine, never bark, trite. Mics up, lights down, we the crew of rounds. Johnny Rubes know the truth, bomb is going round. Catchy beats, the block that never sleeps. 2400 sound in your brain, it creeps. Catchy sounds, the block that never bounds. 2400 toss the substance out of sounds. Catchy beats, the block that never sleeps. 2400 sound in your brain, it creeps. Catchy sounds, the block that never All righty, then we have. Kath Lloyd. She is a motivational speaker, resilience coach, a ceramic artist, um, a gender dysphoria um, therapist for children. I think that's what... Well, no, not really, but gender dysphoria. Gender is part of how I've become who I've become. Oh, okay. Well, uh, it's my dad, my dad who transitions. Oh, okay, but but you do do the uh, for children that are experiencing that same thing. You do the counseling for it. Yeah, support, but often it's the parents as well. Yes. Okay. Well, um, to every the listeners, to the audience, to your audience, welcome to the twenty four hundred block podcast. We are delighted to have you. Um, we tried to do it before i was having technical difficulties and we were talking about it before we came on that um you know it's the things that you you want to ignore but it's an acceptance thing i have all these things happening i i i can't believe this or you'll say all these things to yourself that um will help you get through it's really not because you're not accepting the fact that things happen regardless of whether you whether you're good or you're bad, they're happening. Life is is not this real duality that we have in this world. It's really a monistic oneness that happens. Regard, it's not even personal. And uh, leading up to this podcast, uh, I, I told you that um, you know my car got repoed, and I was just like, "All righty then." And then my back went out, and I was moshing at the skate park because I'm crazy and I love having fun, but those things uh are the resiliencies that you're going to either make or break and it's you know it's not about what it's it's about what you do in those moments and how you show up and i coined a term this morning uh you can put this in your lot you know your oxford dictionary if you want to maybe i'll put it in there but uh determinator that's the term i came up with this morning because i was determined I was like, I'm not letting anything stop me from uh, speaking with Kath this morning. And um, I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and we talked about this before. Uh, one of the things I do um, to get myself, um, get my, my central nervous system regulated is um, breath work. And breath work for me was a foreign thing. Meditation was a foreign thing. But at some point in time, especially being neurodivergent, I tell you that I'm, I have ADHD, autism, a bunch of Ds. I'm a D student. Um, you have to grab onto something. And in my lifetime, I've talked to therapists and not necessarily life coaches, but you get a kind of, you kind of, you get kind of positivity wasted, you know, and in my brain, things are very realistic and if it's not grabbing to those things, then what do I have left? Your own body, your own biological responses. So meditation and breath work were something that was foreign, but was very relevant because I needed to do something. And breath work is so simple when you're in that moment. Um, and I think you mentioned um, being in your head. And for me, I'm in my head a lot. I'm, obviously, I'm a neurodivergent. That moment where I was at the doctor on Monday, you know, my wife's telling me to breathe and I'm coaching her, but that moment when you can coach me in that moment, when I'm tearing up and my back doesn't want me to rest, I do the breath work. So 
what we're going to do is getting to breath work. I do uh, a breath work um, on YouTube from Ben Holt. It's a Wim Hof breath work, breath work. And if you're not familiar with Wim Hof breathing, it's like fire breathing. It's um, a breathing that allows you to regulate your nervous system very fast. And it, on the on Ben Holt, they do 40 controlled breaths. That's a lot for most people. I did 40 controlled breaths when I first started. Again, I'm crazy. Um, and I say crazy very loosely uh, because some people say crazy. What does that mean? Well, to me, it means that I'm a risk taker. <laughs> you know, like I will roll the dice on anything. So the Wim Hof breaths are really good because it helps expand the um, the lungs. But more than anything, it brings much needed oxygen to your brain. And we need that oxygen in order for us to process all this information, the proteins and all the things different neurological synapses that are happening, we need oxygen. And our breathing that we do every day is oxygen. But the oxygen that we breathe in on, do on purpose through breath work is meant to catapult you and bring you to a regulatory state. So without further ado, um, I'm going to guide it. And I will talk through it, even though um, I probably will have to stop my breath to guide it. But um, we're going to breathe in uh, through the to the nose and out to the mouth twice to get us started, kind of prime our, our brains. You know, it's evening for you. It's morning for me. Um, really, it's not really, a, I don't really go by time. I'm just kindred. I don't really do time zones, but um, <laughs> it's evening for you. So you've had your day already. So that breath work is going to be great. So um, without further ado, in through the nose, out through the mouth. In through the nose. We're going to hold it a little second. Out through the mouth. And then we're going to do four control breaths um, through the mouth, into the mouth, and out through the mouth. And um, once we do that, we're going to do it at a rhythm. <sighs> And I'll do a random count. It won't be 40 and I'll, I'll just, you know, tell you when to stop. And then when we get to the point where we do that last breath, we're going to go. And on the exhale breath, we're going to hold that for, um, until, and, and, and mind you, before I, before I get into this, this is very, very, very important. We're not healers professionally. We are healers in a sense that we do what we do um, personally, at least me. I'm not a professional breathwork person, but I do it professionally in myself, but I'm not certified. Cap is a certified life coach, by the way. So she is a professional, but we do not guarantee anything besides the fact that you will be able to be guided and guide yourself. So if you have a problem with breathing, or if you have a problem holding your breath, uh, do the best you can. The whole point is to get breath into your um, lungs. So without further ado, five, four, three, two, one, in through the mouth, out through the mouth, Last one. Hold that breath and exhale. We're going to breathe into the nose in five, four, three, two, one. 
cold at the top. Relax your shoulders, eyes, any muscles that you can notice that are having any tension. And while you're at the top, go ahead and see if you can breathe in through your belly a little bit more. And hold. And we're going to arm the breath in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. And through the nose, out through the mouth. All right, so that first one's the preliminary to get us started. Um, uh, guided meditation is hard for most, um, easy for some. So do the best you can. Now I'm going to go into it without much guided, just a little bit to, to, to keep the continuity. And five, four, three, two, one, into the mouth. <sighs> Last one. Hold at the exhale. We're going to breathe into the nose in five, four, three, two, one. Hold at the top. Relax any muscles that are happening in your eyelids, and your legs, and your shoulders, preferably. Drop your shoulders. Relax your face muscles. You have like a contorted smile, possibly. Just relax that. Your tongue at the top of your roof of your mouth. And if you can, breathe in just a little bit more air into your lungs. <laughs> and hold. We're going to exhale through the mouth in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. And through the nose. Two more rounds. We're going to begin in five, four, three, two, one, into the mouth.
one. Exhale, hold at the bottom. We're gonna breathe into the nose in five, four, three, two, one. All at the top. Drop your shoulder. Take in a little bit of breath if you can. We're going to own the breath in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. Hoping the brains are feeling recharged out there in the world. Uh, this is getting you charged for a day or charged for your sleep. So you can have a really good dream. We're going to do it one more time in five, four, three, two, one. In through the mouth. Give it all you got for this last one. Last breath. Exhale through the mouth and hold. You're going to breathe in through the nose in five, four, three, two, one. And hold. Relax any last muscles that are tense in the body. Mouth, face particularly are ones that we do not remember that are tense. Shoulders. A lot of tension carried in the shoulders. And we're going to try to get a little bit more breath in through the belly. <laughs> and we're going to own the breath in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. And through the nose. Out through the mouth. And on this last exhale, we're just going to take a moment to kind of Walk through your day, whether you're having the start of your day or you're in the afternoon or you're in your evening. Just take a minute to just peel through your day. Focus on any sounds that you may be hearing, any birds that may be chirping, bathroom, toilets that may be flushing, people walking. <laughs> Excuse me, anything that you can focus on to kind of channel your energy while you kind of assess your day for meditation for a couple minutes and then we'll get started.
And yes, you should breathe during this. This is not a hold. This is a, a just a shallow breathing. And whenever you're ready, very slowly and gently open your eyes and come out of it. If you need to do a breath to kind of just finish off that last meditation, you can. It's your world, it's your body, it's your mind, it's your soul. And you deserve the air, the space you're in, and everything that you're doing. It's all in your command and your control. And for you listeners out there that have never done a breath work or meditation, yes, it could be boring, um, but also being stressed out and unable to attain any kind of solutions or any kind of uh, sense of mental stability is probably worse. So anytime you can get a chance to just, even in the midst of noise, find a focal point to just uh, meditate is very fruitful for the brain to um, regulate the central nervous system. And then wherever you're ready, Kath, for I can get a Ruben. There she is. <clears throat> it's really quite difficult, isn't it, to hold that breath in? It is. Big and relax at the same time. It is. Um, one of the more difficult things about doing this, um, and I'll put the link in the description um, for Ben Holt's meditation. It's not a plug. I don't get paid for this. It's more of a personal, everything's a personal journey for me. So if I'm plugging, it's, I'm not getting paid. Um, is when you're at the top of that breath and to hold the air into your lungs and then take in a little bit more and relax, your, like you said, relax your shoulders. It's a it's a little bit of a trapeze act, but if you kind of come out of your head and literally follow the instruction, you kind of almost in a way just follow the yellow, follow the bouncing ball, you know. So um, it it was not it was not difficult for me, and I thought it would would have been. And I've been doing it for probably the breath work probably two years now. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, probably a year, a little over, probably a year and six months, something like that. Um, but the meditation three years. And what I realized um, is that the meditation is great and all, but without the breath work to prime your yourself to be at calm, you're kind of fighting 
to keep your eyes closed. Your eyes want to open up. You're still hearing noises. So what is your what is your uh, take on this breath work and meditation in your um, practice? Well, I mean, usually with breath work, I work on release the the negative thoughts and feelings, the things that you don't want on your out breath, which then does relax you. Right. So it's quite interesting to sort of do it in a slightly different way. And you can really see the benefits of holding that breath and then holding it on the 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 empty you know when you've exhaled everything but yeah. of course breath work for me is great uh, and i try and you know use this with with my clients is yes. when you are one you, you're in a difficult situation mm -hmm. and or there's something that's bothering you perhaps you're ruminating over something and you need to relax the mind to yeah. help you start finding the answers. Yes. And, you know, it's something that really struck me, you know, back about eight years ago um, when my, my son broke his neck and he was on, uh, in um, intensive care. And on day three, I remember sitting outside in the sunshine and thinking, I'm not breathing. <laughs> I thought, hang on a minute. Isn't that insane? I'm asking breathing because I'm alive. Yeah, your heart's pounding. <laughs> but my breath was so shallow. Yeah. Because I was so preoccupied with what was going on in my head. I was anxious. I was tense. I didn't know what the future was going to hold, what was going to happen to my son. All of these things, I was like, uh -uh, like this. And so I was breathing just enough to keep me alive live if I, I actually that would be fight flight or freeze because the freeze part doesn't get brought up a lot in that that um that verbiage but the freeze part is the anxiety overload to the point where your body and this was just something i had happened yesterday as a matter of fact it was a, a, a such a scenario that i was not expecting and you know being autistic and ADHD there's a big control factor I want and it's not even intentional but when it, it was out of my control to where I was unexpected my I was I was cold and hot at the same time and I'm not sure if it's the weather changes but that lack of a, of a thermostatic control I was I was in a not a good place and I wasn't I didn't forgot to eat you know in that moment so you're right that breathing, you almost forget it. You forget to breathe. <laughs> and, and, you know, I started calling it function. So you got fight, flight, freeze, fawn, function. And I was oh, okay. doing, my body was just doing enough to function, to get by, ah. to be able to be oh, what I needed God. to be and do what I needed to do. That's amazing. I have not quite... Uh... That last, that function part, that is very brilliant because you're, that tells you how smart our bodies are. We have the medical community, respect to the medical community, but I have my reservations regarding, you know, being this, we're in charge of your health thing versus the body that knows what to do. That was been created, it's been here. Who knows, scientists, any scientists on here that want to chime in on how long the human bodies have been doing this knows what to do. But we have these instructions that we think we have to go by. But you said it function. The body will do what it has to do to function to stay alive. And that's a that's an F that doesn't get brought up in there as well. You're right. And, and, and if you think about it, you know, when you're in a situation you know, you've been thrown into a situation that is trauma, you know, and and you, you still wake up the next morning. Yeah, right. The autonomic, yeah, yeah the auto, they, it's, it's the parasympathetic and the autonomic nervous system. But you're right, that automatic process, that is the, what we you know, I don't get religious or anything, but there is a divine energy that is allowing, you know, that is not your choice that's happening regardless of whether you like it or not, all these neurological synapses happening 
at 200 and something miles per hour, billions of them, that's happening automatically. And we don't even think about that. So our bodies are trying their best and every cause to preserve. And when that, um, I'm sorry, that cold, hot feeling, that's blood rushing from extremities to preserve all the vitals. Hey, I don't know what's going on, but we got things to do. You know, like in your case, you have a son, he's hurt, and you can afford <laughs> to not be functioning right now. <laughs> but we're all busy inside. Yeah. Doing our best for you. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. And in, in right as you say that, the doing our best, that's what you said, correct? The doing our best, what does that mean? You know, because at the end of the day, we're doing our best according to what layout, a layout that our parents laid out for us, society laid out for us, that the world laid out for us. And we begin to get into what this segment really is about, self-honesty and truth and being yourself. We start to become something else. And um, again, not getting paid for this, but... um, you know, I I I uh, really confide in Joe Dispenza. He's a, a chiropractor, epigenetist, a neuroscientist, and he talks about um, your personal reality. Your personality is your personal reality, and that can change. You know, so we begin to um, adopt a certain attitude and think this is it. You know, I'm a piece of I'm a piece of doo doo. If I'm not doing this, if I'm a piece of this and and now you're not even your own best friend anymore. So um, what I wanted to do today, which is I feel that there's a lot of techniques and books and things that I've read over the years. I mentioned positivity, wasted. I wanted to go through what it would be like. And we it's not going to be the whole segment, probably 15 minutes or so of our present moment. After doing breath work, it's almost like a reset, you know, and you are a life coach, um, artist, teacher. You're so many titles. Even you get taxed because we're all humans. And even though you're being the person that's helping someone, you still need your cup poured back into. So in this present moment, I would say that one of the things that are um making it hard um and this would be i guess it'd be an example of what you'd kind of go through with your client in a session and we could do a little sample i'm dealing with the fact that i have a neurodivergent family and i'm learning about this later in my life because my layout was you're the man and you gotta go work so i joined the navy i did that i did i checked all my boxes and when the boxes don't check because I'm very like literal when it comes to you do this, then you get this result. It's not an exact science. So I'm dealing with the fact that I'm learning this much later. And we all have three different presentations of sensory processing disorder and all the different things in the spectrum. And those collide a lot. And how I know they're real is that most times when there's my my spouse and I, we recently separated at the top of this year because not in reconcilable differences, they're neurological differences and how I might be overstimulating her because my vocal tone is very baritone. So it might it might cause her to have a trauma response from when she was a child because of I have a booming voice. She will get into a point where her trauma response I'm not trying to spot, but her one of her things is I call it antagonizing, but it's really like um making fun as a nervous response to kind of like it's a comedy thing. My son will do some of something similar, but he stems by he's moving. And I mean supernova moving. So those things have been things we've been dealing with for quite a bit of time. But you're talking about learning about it later in life. And you're trying to figure yourself out and your son. And, you know, so when you get to that point where you're frustrated, you don't know what to do. I'm like, I got my breath and work in my meditation. But 
what else do I do? So they, the resiliency of that is kind of what I'm dealing with. So what would you be doing for a person that would be neurodivergent, struggling with these multitude of things that are more silent to the world, but a handicap like being physical is very apparent, but a handicap in the mind is not. So they're going to basically say, you're good. I don't see any problem. Well, I think when you, when you talk about, I, I mean, I just want to clarify something a minute. You talk about handicap in the mind or handicap in the body. Are mm-hmm. you talking about a physical disability rather than a mental disability? Yeah. In my case, it is both. Um, but I'm separating them because when we go in our society and we park in the, you know, we go to the grocery store, whether it's a handicap parking, go to anywhere, there's a handicap parking, but there's not a handicap section for an ADHD person or a handicap sticker because we just haven't got there as a society yet. I yeah. mean, mental health is really only like probably, let's just say max 200 years old as far as what we've discovered and how we can help. Um so yes, it's a separation. I deal with both um, because of my spine, and but my mind has this disability, but I have to continually explain this, and you might not get the accommodations because they're not quite sure how to roll that out. It's not part of their structure. So how do I internally stop saying, oh, I'm, I'm autistic, and how do I find calm with that? You know what I mean? So I can besides breathwork and meditation and probably all the other things I've been through? Well, I think, you know, one of the things to ask yourself is while you're in doing your meditation section Mm -hmm. after your breathwork is to start challenging yourself on why... I mean, you have learnt an awful lot about your abilities about the you know the neurological differences right. between you your wife your son and a lot of other people that are around you mm-hmm. but also what's really important to do is to start understanding why the label is important okay because we label everything male right. female you know um uh, and and now, with the differences with with gender, it's transgender, trans trans woman, trans man, trans yeah. fluid. You know, all of the and we we it keeps us safe by labeling things, right? But it's for me, it's about understanding why it's safe for you and what okay. it is giving you. So, for example. Um, you know, when my dad transitioned, mm-hmm. I found it really, really difficult. Yeah. And and I slid myself into victim mode. So the question I had to ask myself is, why am I staying in victim mode when it is not serving me well? Yes. What is special about the situation? Why do I struggle with it? When there's mm-hmm. no need to struggle with it. Right. Because, you know, my dad, who is now Joan, is happy, is healthy, probably mm-hmm. the happiest that she has ever been. So why am I making myself stay in that mode? What benefits is it giving me? You're right. That that You said it right on the money. Is pausing yourself... And checking yourself and saying, why, why am I, why are you, why are you taking it personal? Because it is your father. So, and now it's Joan. So it's, it's a whole understanding validation for yourself, but at the same time, Joan, also your dad. So yeah, um, that why is big and important. So for you, for example, you know, you, 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 you said it really, you know, with you, your wife your son that this is the way you are okay this is the way you were you you were made the way your brain was knitted together Mm -hmm. that he's given you this difference this uniqueness that is you 
Man, I'm, I'm feeling the chills of validation. Case, um... I know I'm feeling those chills of validation because I I didn't know how I was going to come into this because you learn something much later than the you know the societal norm. Now you have to kind of chart this and ex- instead of acceptance, I have to wholeheartedly how long ever it takes for me to accept myself. But more than accepting myself, I had to accept my wife's words because they were foreign to me. The things she would say, and she didn't know, we didn't, we didn't know all this until literally the end of last year, but the things she would say makes sense now because I, when she said it, I did a ton of research because I need to understand. But I had to accept her for what she was saying and take everything that I thought and how I thought about it away set it to the side. And it took, yes, it took separation. It took many, 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 I call it the witching hour at two o'clock in the morning where she's sitting up there having her moment and I'm sitting there like, why is she doing this? Like, I'm asking the why, but I'm asking it more in a reactive way. Not, a, not in a way to understand. I thought I was, but I, then when I understood her, I, you know, it helped me go, okay, now I see that my son. Then it came my way. Oh my God, these are things that I'm struggling with. So it started not with me first. It started with her, then my son, then me. And then a whole light bulb went out, just like the one I'm looking at right now. Like, this is real. This is, I'm accept. I'm accepting this. I think I am. So that's, you're right. Is an acceptance. I mean, this this happens to all of us. It can, you know, the work colleague that really irritates you, you know, the next door <laughs> neighbor that really irritates you, right. the sibling, you know, because the majority of people we get along with, we rub along nicely together, but everybody's got their little differences, you know, their little um, quirky habits. You're right. And it is about sometimes because, you know, we can't change somebody else. We can influence somebody else, but we can't change somebody else. And it yeah. is just like you have been talking about is that is the way they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't change it. That is the way they are. And I have to accept that for the way it is. And deal with it. Yeah, and that's and that's and that's uh that's uh what I would say an on purpose dis- decision. You have to on purpose decide to rise above or sweep it on a carpet. I'm uncomfortable with that. That doesn't make me feel good. I'm done. And I'm not a person that says that. But I, I would say in these la- I'm 48 years old. I'm like I've done nothing but resilience my whole life. I think I'm done with that. But life to the very end of your line is resilience. Like this, everybody's, this is, okay, well, depending on how you look at it, you know, whether you're really a reincarnation or not, but for the layman, this is our first time being a human. So grace, you know, (laughs) grace. I don't, so yeah, I decided on purpose to be, uh, like I co- I told you uh, before we uh, started, is determined. I'm the determinator. I'm I'm not quitting on my family, no matter what. This is, you know, when you said, why am I, why why is this affecting me, and why am I allowing this to to be to hold me back? Was a determination thing. You, it has to bring you to a point to ask a question, because you love your. You love Joan, you love your dad that much to be a determinator. So Oxford Dictionary, determinator. <laughs> I'm not sure it's in there. You know, all this stems from put your, putting your hand on your heart and being totally honest with yourself. And it's not easy because it is going to bring up things that you don't like about yourself. Yeah, and I you don't, know. yeah, I don't like you emotions. Know. Mm-mm. You know, those thoughts that you wish you'd never had, the guilt, the shame, 
all of those sorts of things. You know, even though you are going through life being the good daughter, keeping relationships going, mm -hmm. you know, as as best as you can, but you know there's still something going on, on or in your head going round and round going, I don't like this. I don't like that I can't see Joan as my dad anymore, my father figure. Why mm -hmm. has he had to do that? Right. As in, why has he punished him? Like, like, like it's that? on purpose. <laughs> like, and like, wasn't. <laughs> like, Dad, why did you have to change? Because this is affecting me. And they're like, wait a minute, this is my life. <laughs> you know, and it's, and this is why once you can clear the guilt and the shame, then it is a process of having to go through all of those back issues right. that are still troubling you to clear them out of the way and then every time something some issue that is niggling in the back of your mind comes up it's about going through that process asking right. that why question why am i feeling like this why am i thinking like this why am i acting out like this mm -hmm. and then it's well what do i want instead yeah, you said right. What somebody asked me that yesterday, and I was thought it was obvious. And they're like, "What do you want out of this?" I was like, "X X X." Isn't it obvious? But it's not because words and you saying them almost reverberating back to yourself is almost like a confirmation that this is in fact what I want. But my actions seem to be showing something different to someone. But when that question is asked, it's almost like a calibration of what you want versus your actions. And they're all lining up because we can't, you know, I, I know now through all the different researching is that emotions, they come and they go. They're like waves. They come, they go and they ebb and they flow. And we're sitting up here going, oh, my God, I'm mad. I'm sad. And I'm going to be this way forever. But like a wave. That one wave is the last wave is going to be because there's going to be so many other unique waves. And like a surfer, the, the wave catches you. You don't catch the wave. So you you do all your things and your skill to do it. But I learned that emotions um, that I kind of got more associated with last year to rehab is something I can't avoid. I'm an avoider as a as an artist. I'm an I, I don't like feeling them and I don't know how to process them, nor did I know whether I was mad or anxious. I just was like, this is uncomfortable. You know, the emotions are there to tell you how you're feeling. Go figure. I didn't I didn't want to be told that. I, I was like, I've got to work. And if I don't do that, um my emotion is gonna be anxiety and not having work. And I stayed and I got told by therapists is that I've, I'm more in my head, not in the world. And I really am. I'm really so strategic that so then, it was all logical. Sorry. So then what it's about, it's marrying up your emotions with how you want to be acting, with what you're saying, with the way you're saying it. Mm. Because we're very in tune with, well, they said the right words, but there's just something off about how they were saying it and that means it's not all married up right you know that's why great actors are believable because Ooh. they marry everything up together and Ooh. that's how you believe their character that is powerful that is very powerful and it's just that is the same with us so yeah. you're in the middle of an argument with your spouse but you want to make it right and you say but i love you <laughs> you've said the word but it's not really believable because you're still caught up with yeah. all of this emotion that is coming from the row yeah it's like you're trying yeah yeah yeah, yeah i love you too yeah it's like you're trying and to throw so out like a continue. yeah you're throwing out like a i love you to get it over with because i do but i'm mad but being mad is not bad and i realize I can be mad and I have a right to be depressed and I, I want to be that, but I don't have time for it because I never made time for it because I felt like it was my responsibility 
to not be emotional so I can carry us forward. And that is toxic, but it was the reality. And it's the reality of most people, not saying men, not saying women, but people carrying something and having to rise above based on your circumstances, whether you grow up a little faster because you had to be the kid who raised your mom because they were sick or whatever the case may be. But this is the time to unmask, you know, and that's that's kind of what we're doing right now is unmasking and breaking it down. And it's and you've got to be you've got to be realistic about about it, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, going back to my son when he was in ITU and I mean, then he he went really, really poorly and. And the consultant came in with all these minions. And it was very rare for, for somebody besides the nurses to ask me how I was. And he got his back turned to him and he goes, and Mrs. Lloyd, how are you? And I, that day, I was so angry with my son. Ooh. Having had that accident, breaking his neck, being there, oh, you know. Yeah making me feel so much emotional pain that I felt as if my heart was just going to explode inside of my body. And I just said, well, actually, I, at this very moment, I could beat him to a pulp. And all the minions went oh, like this, as yeah. if to say, you shouldn't be saying things like that. He's oh, my son. God, can He's you? So you know, you should be there yeah. nurturing him, looking after him. And mm -hmm. the consultant just turned around and he said, you're his mother. You're entitled to feel like that. You know, you just said something. And that made me feel, and that, yeah. that comment from him made it all wash away. It was fine. Yeah, and, and you just said something that's probably the height of keeping a mask on, is that you have to be the one to to show face and not show what you really feel and be there and be the nurturer. And, that is exactly how the mask, that's the glue. It's why my mask stays on, because I got to show face. I got to not show what I really feel, which is anger, resentment, frustration. And my son, he's doing these things that are just, I'm like, guy, I, you, I'm a military guy. I'm, you know, for those who, under, you know, California or know the United States and know certain places in the United States, like Compton, Long Beach and Linwood, these are like rough areas. And then you got, you know, your New Yorks and your Chicago, every, every area you got. But these are like known ones. Compton, Long Beach, these are where gangsters are. These are places where I grew up. And I'm thinking, this guy is challenging me. And I, I had to like question, well, if he's challenging me, then what am I? But I can't because his he doesn't understand the boundaries between me and him or him and I, but what do I do? So that was the thing. Like you were able to just be, say your thing about your son's actions, but there are people who no matter how they want to say what they really feel about others' actions, almost forced into that prison where they have to show face because the person doesn't understand. They may look like they do, but they don't. So how do you un unmask and be your authentic self when you're trying to speak your piece and the person doesn't really understand that they're violating you or crossing boundaries? Well, I think this is a situation that you have to weigh up, isn't it? Mm. You know, is it safe to really say what you really want? need to say and want to say and is it going to be listened to correctly right. and this is where it can get really difficult can't it <laughs> you know yeah. um but um you know you say the wrong thing to the wrong person they take it the wrong way they think that you, you, you you're going to follow through with that action and it gets really, really complicated. And so this is why there's different ways of downloading this information, you know, that, you know, we so much is talked about, about downloading, journaling, diarising, 
gratitude, you know, talking things through with somebody that you trust. Um, and if you can't find that somebody of trust that will give you the respect, um, then this is where it's you, you perhaps need to find a professional to help you do that because mm. if you keep internalizing all of this information it's going to clog up your brain it's going to overwhelm you it's going to overstretch you it's going to have an effect on your decision making skills it's going to have an effect on how you keep your relationships going how you can run your daily life let alone anything that's more difficult that is thrown in your way mm -hmm. to help you release it <laughs> otherwise all of that turmoil that you are clinging on to because that's what you're doing you're clinging on to it in mm. in your body is going to have an effect on your physical body you're right. And then you've not only got your mental health to sort out, you've then got your physical health. To which sort brings out. me into somatic symptom disorder, which is where your body is now. It goes from anxiety straight to back pain, you know, body straight to knee pain, body. And that's where I'm at. So that's the physical aspect. I never had many physical issues until and it takes the mind, uh, the mind and body a long time to become. um what's called, um, uh, forgive me, I, it's a mind-body disconnect and it's mind-body coherence. So when that coherence is off for so long, now we're getting to epigenetics where the body's like, okay, um, I'm feeling this way. And the brain's like, well, I'm not going to keep seeing that signal. So let's, you take care of that because we haven't figured that out. And then when you're disconnected so long, then you start to go, okay, this is who I am. I'm in pain and all that other stuff. But you said it is the, per, you know, you obviously, I'm not going to say, son, I'm going to take, I'm going to say all the things I need to say. He's six years old. And my wife, um, there is a traumatic freeze in her brain from childhood and different segments of life that's not going to also hear it either. So what I've had to do, again, meditation and breath work and dive within and look within myself. So that way, like you said, it's, that is them is separate from me, who I am and what's happening and what they're saying is are, they're two different things. I am experiencing my experience because of what is being said, but I have, I can, I can gravitate. And I, I and I think we spoke about this briefly in, in one of our, in our meet and greet is that moment, that very moment, like when, and you know, this is happening, you're in the hospital and you're like, dude, this guy, he really, he really, his spinal cord really, you, you took all my momming hard work and you broke your back. And in that moment, son, you, I've told you this a million times. You cannot do this. And I have boundaries, brother. And in that moment, that's when the chemicals are spreading. And you have either the tools you're going to use or the same reaction. You can respond or you can react. So that's, that's what you're gravitating towards when it comes to the, act, the overall picture. Uh, but, and also it's learning, you know, about... Well, it's all about learning and understanding yourself so you can manage your emotions, feelings, thoughts, your actions a lot more easily. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, we, we all experience different emotions, different thoughts, different feelings differently. The intensity can be different. Right. And this is why communication is so important, isn't it? You know, yeah. because... And 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 this is why when you go and see your your doctor about your back pain, they'll ask you from zero to ten how painful is it? Eight, and that's and what he said. I said on Monday, <laughs> with a grimace. But actually, it might be a nine, and you're not yeah, trying right. to sound like too much of a a wimp, you know. <laughs> but I'm not saying that you're a wimp. Um, but this is why it's so important to understand the 
disparity of you, but appreciate that somebody else might be different. Right. And you know, because yeah. or or hear it differently, see it differently. It's like the color yellow. Well, is that a lemon yellow? Is it a sunshine yellow? Is it an egg yeah. yellow? Variations. Yeah, variations. It's all of the variations that come with it. So mm. we all experience bereavement, loss, pain, but then it's your own version of it. And so if we can explain more about what it is for you, then it's easier for other people to understand you and for you to understand yourself as well. So it's building up a vocabulary of descriptive words to help you describe that pain, that feeling of loss, that bereavement. You're right. And and I and I and I definitely can say, and and I'll I'll ask you the same question is the journey of the pain. And pain is a lesson. You know, when you're in a gym, you go through pain, you, muscles tear down, you have growth. Pain equals growth. I don't, you know, in your mind, I don't want to go through this any longer. How come and, you know, how come and the whys become a little redundant. But what I've learned is I cannot, I cannot in any way say I don't want to go through the journey that's almost similar to saying I don't want to, to live anymore be, because every day, is every way and every moment, you're not going to ever know how whatever it is that you're going through is going to bring the healing um, unbeknownst to how you, you know, saw it in your head, you know. So, OK, I've done this and I've done this, so I should be here. And I've I've learned. You know, and it's a very hard one to let go and just let the journey be because if i if i am gra grabbing tools then a journey is going to be a bunch of things that i can't really put my finger on how it's going to happen so for the for the you know those who are tuning in right now that right now moment how how do you keep that person understanding that you cannot exit from the actual lessons that are going to happen in your daily life in order to you know fortify these tools that you're talking about well i think you know the word exit is quite uh i quite like quite an interesting term and i quite like that but yeah. it's for me it would be why why do you feel you need to exit what if life got better what would that give you if life got better well in in my case yeah in my case i am a suicide survivor i i happen to have a strong willpower um and i'm not saying another don't but mm -hmm. it's 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 my moniker to keep me you know well above hope but in that moment i said my son and my greatest potential these are things I don't want to leave this earth until I release one of them. And that was the moment where I was kind of pissed at my, my intuition and my, I call it my inner awesome me. Um, why, why am I going to have to keep living this and being in pain in order to get to this lesson that you're wanting me to learn? And I said, I, I, I cannot bring my son on this earth and leave him in this condition because I'm going to put him in a position to have a lesson that he's going to have to learn in an extremely painful way. And he's going to pass that on. Now, we know we live our lives to teach someone else. And that's kind of, you know, we don't know that, but we're literally living our lives as a lesson to somebody else and ourselves. But I can't disappoint my son. And I cannot, will not leave this earth without at least seeing some fruits from my greatest potential. And that was the things that my intuition was telling me, do you really want to, you know, and for me, I was going to, you know, go in front of a, a truck. I'm a trucker or former trucker. 
Ed, do you want to ruin this guy's life? You know, these are questions that were happening in my head. These are real questions that were happening in my head. And this, it happens at a very fast a second. And I said, no, I don't, but I'm in pain. And for those who struggle with suicidal ideations, it is a real solution in that moment. And for those who don't understand, it's still real. But it's a, it's a cognitive distortion in that moment that is so distorted that the reality has completely shifted. That's where breath work came in for me, where I, I didn't, at that moment, I wasn't breathing. I just had my intuition and some willpower, my son and my greatest potential. But yeah, that exit was a real thing. And, you know, the, it's, it's the knock-on effect of that, isn't it? You know, the truck driver, your son your wife, other family and friends, you know, those sorts of things. Who is going to be affected by it? That, but because we can get so inside of our own mind, we lose sight of those things. And it's almost like putting the stop sign up in front of you and say, stop, let's stop. Let's just stop this thought and find a way. Mm -hmm. what's another way that I can do life that I don't affect all of those people in that way that that truck driver will carry on his life as he is now that my son won't be distraught mm -hmm. and have numerous numerous queries and questions about why I did that mm -hmm. and why he may be blaming himself for that. Right. And that, that, yeah, that one's, that one's a hard one to swallow. A person who has no idea what they're about to experience and they're going to have to grow up. They're going to have to, they're going to be in a lot more pain because it's happening so early. And my son is mini me you know he really loves i really love him and i knew you know in that moment that those things were weighing on me and that is you know again i don't know what happens in 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 the moments for others that have gone and passed but at least it was enough to let me know that I must be chosen enough to at least have that happen to me in order to be here because i did go to rehab i went to the you know to the, you know it's 5150 is what it called when you go in and you I went to the, you know, a veteran. So I went to the VA hospital. I'm sitting up there in a surreal moment, like, oh, I'm wearing these scrubs, looking like a, like a Looney Tune or whatever. But I say, like, at least I decided to come. And then I go on and be there for 22 days. And I go on to um, a rehabilitation center. And it's a rare, rare thing in life. And it shouldn't be to where you get to that place before you go to a rehabilitation center. It should be proactive. But you get a pause life. Because all those responsibilities and things that we got to do to uphold and show that mask is what keeps it on. I had a chance to be, and uh, it was, it's, again, this is, I'm not getting paid for this, but it's a uh, Monterey mm -hmm. Healthcare. Um, and it was a, a, a Mac Miller uh, had, is the rapper, Mac Miller had a mansion in Studio City, and that's what became Monterey's Behavioral Healthcare Center. And it was just, I, I could not have I could not have dreamt that rehabilitation process up if I tried because it was it was a place of complete solitude. I was able to really look within. We, we did sound baths, we did meditation, we did medications, we did all these things that are outside of the norm for healing. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, how can they don't have these things every day for people that are these are things that we should be going through every day as proactive, but we're a reactive society. Oh, this person, good. Let's let's give them the deepest, but then there's insurance. And I'm not gonna even get into that. But it was so great that I decided to listen to that inner voice enough to get that experience. And here am I to talk about it, you know? And I've mentioned, oh, I'm suicide survivor before, and people kind of you know, not deer in the headlights, but they come almost numbingly bleeds past it in their script. But that was, that, that's real. It was a real, and I, you know, this is a book, again, um, not getting paid for this, 
uh, Gabrielle Bernstein, the universe has your back. And she says that, you know, it's the universe when the outcome was so much more mind boggling than you could have even imagined. That yeah. is why I keep doing this because I've had a taste of things that are well beyond my imagination. And this meditation and breath work has been great. But I want to really get into you. Um, uh, you have written books about your father and the transition to Joan and um, Four Steps of Emotional Freedom. So we'll get into uh, that. And what after was it after a grieving process that the book kind of formulated or did it well, just kind of yes <laughs> yeah and it, when, and the book, uh, uh, by the way is um when dad became joan so here yeah. it is got it here sorry yeah, it's dad, became when joan. dad became joan yeah it's, and uh, at I the mean, bottom here is living with normal living which is really important normal, normal. Yeah. Um, which is really important because change comes whether we choose the change ourselves or whether it is thrust upon you that you didn't want. And it throws us off balance totally. Mm -hmm. And life feels alien, can feel alien to us, you know, because we are thrown so off balance. And so that is, you know, and, and gradually life you get used to the new life right and it becomes your new normal but that time span depends on how long you are going to fight it for so it could be this big it could be this big it could be that big all right now even and, and we go through a process mm -hmm. all right and it's you you go into you know it's everybody else's fault that you're in denial and and you don't want to confront the situation because it's too painful but then you might start confronting it thinking yeah i need to change this and it'd be but it's too difficult it's a bit painful i'm all right at the moment i'll manage mm -hmm. but then gradually and it's mostly when the pain is greater than the gain mm, that yeah. is when most people want to start making changes yeah so for that me, or want to exit uh, don't exit people uh for you those out there that are thinking this is where i should exit no this is about resilience and resilience uh the r in resilience also stands for responsibility um responsibility to your um you're kind of your contract. You know, we have a contract to be, to live our lives. And the simplest thing we can do is enjoy our lives and be happy. And I think that's enough to be able to go, all right, I've lived my life, but we're busy trying to uphold. So you're, don't exit. <laughs> so for me, the book really, when I hit my, at the end of my bereavement cycle mm -hmm. for my dad, and I talk about it in my book, I, you know, I describe it very, very clearly that day mm. when I finally hit the end of that bereavement, it was like a whole weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I felt light. I felt happier. I felt calmer. I felt more peaceful. And I thought, if I have been feeling like this, how many other people have been feeling like this? And they right. don't know what to do about it. Yeah, that is the very important question is that your struggle is now a teacher. And it's not a struggle that ever ends because it's not like you're completely over it. You know, you're, that is an introduction to, be, to the, really the healing process that's a lifelong so that so you know when dad became joan it's in two parts so it's the story of how i did or didn't manage it <laughs> but then the part two is the self-help seven steps to living your new normal which is basically what i took myself through to get to that okay so then my second book four steps to emotional freedom and again i've got here 
living with normal. And I'll I I'll, add, I'll add your books into the uh, description so Thank they can much. definitely check Thank those out. Much. Yeah. This is almost like proceeds when Dad became Joan because this is about why are you thinking like this? Mm. Why are you allowing this to interfere with you, you living inside your head rent free and affecting everything that you do? Right. And so this book really, you know, is about the differences between how you start to manage right. and how you how you manage more easily by learning and understanding yourself. Right. So for me to start living my new normal with Joan probably mm. took me 20 years. So that but, the, the bereavement process took 20 years? Probably took me 20 years because I was fighting it. Got you. All of the way. But my bereavement process for my son with his spinal cord injury, and I say bereavement because he's still alive, but he's not the son that I gave birth to, Right, was five years. And so now I am grateful that I felt all of that emotional pain and physical pain, you know, when my dad transitioned. Because I was able to manage the the emotional pain that I felt with my son's accident so much more easily. Right. And that and so it was acknowledging it. It was acknowledging it, you know, with my dad and saying, Yes, and I don't like it. Right. I don't like it. And this is why I don't like it. This is how it's making me behave. This is how it's making me feel. But this is what I want instead. I don't want to feel like that. I'm bored. Basically, I was bored with feeling like that. Right. <laughs> and we can bore ourselves. Oh, my ourselves. God. That's a very interesting way to put it. We can bore ourselves, let alone everybody that, else, with how we are feeling. And so why, why do we, like you said before, why do we torture ourselves like this when Really, all we want is to be happy. Right. And you said something that was really important is that you can start, you can be feeling, because again, emotions, until you get bored of being on that wave. You're, and the first wave was 20 years. The one, the second was five. So you have this, okay, now I have this construct of maybe I should step over and stop being bored. <laughs> and and figure out what I need to do to thrive versus survive. So that was like a important thing is having a basic construct of how how to operate with this and then be able to go from five to two years. And I'm not saying it's never going to be that perfect where, you, oh, now we're down to one day, but it's still taking that re responsibility to be a little bit more proactive. Yes. Because you can, yeah. you can, you can tear your mind completely apart, and that won't be an exit. It will just be a demolish at that point. And and unfortunately, I can't remember who said it, which is a bit of a shame because I would have liked to have said who 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 said it. Yes, we can't help what has happened in our life, but it comes to a stage where we have to be accountable. Right. So that we can Another, yeah, accountability. and then move on from it. And so this is why in four steps to emotional freedom, I've got my four steps methodology to emotional freedom, which is self-honesty. Yeah. Asking, challenging yourself with those difficult questions, then acknowledging and accepting them. What do you want? to help you move you forwards and then what are the actions you are going to take to get there and then right. when you've done those actions you go back to the self-honesty 
how effective were those actions? Are they keeping me on track? Do I need to alter them? Are, are there some new things that I need to do? How are they making me feel? And you go keep going through that cycle so that you're always moving forwards, challenging yourself to find the better way forwards for you that is then going to have an, a knock-on effect to everybody else around you. Now, a knock-on effect with your relationships, right. how you run your home, how you manage at work, how you manage all of these difficult roles and responsibilities that we are expected to do effortlessly every day. Now, is it a possibility? Because there's the other side of the spectrum, which is the person that doesn't get sick and tired of being tired. The person that is in the pity party that literally cannot get out of the repeat of the self-soothing of complaining about it. What and I know in your time doing this, you've been able to like identify those who are not going to be able to receive it and those who are having a hard time. How do you work with the person who is in that moment and you know they're at the cusp of being tired enough to do something about it, or the person who just uh they're 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 stuck in it. They're gonna like where how do you categorize people that are in that place where they just they're they're hard they're hard selves? They're definitely definitely hard sales. But and it's there will be some small there will be change. Right. But it may be tiny weeny change. And even if we are ready to, and this is really important, where even if we are ready to accept change, we're willing to put our hand up, you know, and say we don't want it anymore, and we're willing to be totally honest with ourselves and, you know, go through all of those thoughts that we don't like, you're still going to revert back. There are times when you're still going to revert back. Oh, that's important. All right? Yeah. And that's really, really important to understand that yeah. and to recognize it and to accept it for what it is. And it's a natural process of the healing system. Right. <clears throat> but it's going to be quite different for the people who are active in moving forwards and the ones who are struggling to stay in that place. Yeah. of disassociation, the, the trauma, there are still going to be move, there's still going to be positive steps forward, but they're going to be a lot smaller, a lot more minute than for other people. And so the process is going to be so much slower. Right. And, and this that... is why, mm -hmm. and this is why we can't, compare ourselves to other people because we're all on a separate journey right this is you know and this is why it's important to realize that somebody else's pain may be less than yours or way worse than yours they might have had more experience of trauma in their past life than you have so everybody has got a different starting point yeah and that's kind of where i would say the comparison only happens because of, again, our societal norms and what our parents taught us and whether it be brother and sister comparisons, um, you know, work, co-worker comparison. <clears throat> the diving within is what allowed me to not compare. I, I mean, of course, I still, and I, and I, and I can already see in, in this segment that we're building a cycle. And I think if a person sees a cycle that they can see, okay, I'm going to do something positive. Then, like you said, I'm then I'm going to actually um, retract back. And if a person knows that they are going to do that, even though it seems like it's common sense that they will, I think seeing that little, almost sound like a brain map, okay, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. Whereas you're kind of kind of going at it improv. I got to feel this way. God, why do I feel this way? And if you don't know that, yes, I'm going to end up retracting then you're going to stay in that. But diving within is taking yourself out of the comparison process altogether. I mean, there's harmony and diversity in how we all are different. 
but there is amazingness within yourself that we don't even be, we we have we haven't even uncovered the amazingness with just within and i think if we yes. can really just as a society focus on like you said self honesty and who are you you won't compare yourself if you are spending enough time with yourself and i know that's a scary thing to say i don't want to spend time with myself is a it's a it's Halloween, man. Every day, <laughs> every day in there. I call it the cycle circus. It's a cycle circus in there. I don't want to deal with it. Three years of meditating. That cycle circus is no near where near what it was to me. It wasn't this foreign. It's not a foreign thing anymore. I now understand the chaos because I also have aphantasia. So I cannot visualize things the way others do. I started to understand, finally, I don't have to do guided ones. I can focus on a sound that'll help me drone out <clears throat> into my meditation. But I won't, I wouldn't have known that until I dived within. And what I mean by dive within for the audience that is listening, close your eyes. And meditation is not just closing your eyes. It could be, you could be gardening. It's that place in time. You could be riding your bike. It's that moment where you're awake but you're connected. It's a it's a whole different feeling. And it you know, meditation's always deemed as the close your eyes thing. And for people who get bored, <laughs> it's not just that. So the diving within is a very important aspect, I believe, in not taking as much time or looping. And and you know, it's I'm really pleased that you talked about different ways of using meditation you know because I mean I go out and walk my dogs first thing in the morning for an hour that's what we do and yeah. you know and then I go out again in the afternoon and it's my way with my dogs to get my fresh air to get my exercise but to just be with me right just you know with yourself and listen to the birds, look at the sun coming through the through the leaves, feeling the rain on my face, whatever, right. the slidey footwork with the mud, whatever it is. But it's, and, and I'm a firm believer in, in this, it, it, there isn't just one solution to all of this. Right. It's a whole succession of solutions and it's going to be, and and different combinations and it's going to be different for everybody and it's finding your way you know right. is it about going and having bath with some candles and read the book with some beautiful music on is mm. it about going for the walk is it about going and, and running for a couple of miles it's about getting our flow mm -hmm. our internal flow so that we can be us and allow, and allow the processing of the healing to manage because when we you know when we're highly anxious when we're stretched and stressed the the tempting thing to do is to do more of it right you know because you don't want to stop because if you stop that's when you're going to think about it right but you have got to allow yourself to stop to be able to think about it go through the pain of thinking about it unfortunately so that you can start managing it right come out the other side yeah it was something that came to mind and uh i, I i'm uh I'm, I'm excited to say this because a lot of my intuition has gradually increased from meditation and um, breath work is I, I, it was a phrase that just popped in my head while you're talking is not giving up, but giving in. Giving in is giving back to yourself. Giving up is, oh, okay, I'm done. Okay, I, I don't I'm want exiting. to have to deal with this. And even, even it's okay to give up, but just get back up. You can give up, but it can be temporary. Giving up doesn't necessarily have to be, I completely stop, but giving in is giving back to yourself where the world is taking from you in order for these lessons and all that to happen but you can give in walk your dog take a bath for 
even if it's if you took one this morning, take another one in the middle of the day. It's okay. It's not no one's gonna fire you for taking another shower or whatever the case may be. So I mean, <laughs> that's that was a then when I came to my head, it was just you know like well, what if I want to give up? What what if I'm tired of this? Okay, that's a signal. You just said it. These signals are the body saying I am tired or I don't want to do this. You cannot want to do something, and it's okay. But completely given up is the exit, you know, and that's that's why this your work is extremely important. The book is extremely important. Uh, resilience coach. That's a whole nother. You know, I think um, the term life coach was coined by uh, Tony Robbins, but resiliency is all of us. We're all, and most people think, well, I'm not resilient because I'm not a third world country, been shot at, like, you know, and, and you know, my heart goes out to the, you know, the the Palestinian um, uh, war that's happening. And we compare, again, I compare, we're not, I'm not going through, that. but resiliency is the fact that you're hurting and you are sick and you're trying your best to revive for your family but you're still doing it and you can not go to work if you don't want to tomorrow because you have to be able to do that. So you're right. We have to respect who we are, you know, and be honest with ourselves because if we don't, you are living, you're, you're living a comparison version of yourself according to somebody else's image. Now you are a Ted talker. From uh, TEDx Wolver. TEDx, not a TED talk. There's a bit, uh, a bit you know what, TED talk. You know, I get them. I get them mixed up. My bad. A TEDx Wolverhampton. Um, how did that? How did that uh, come about? Uh, was it with the book or afterwards or how did that? You know, when you have these things, I fancy doing a TEDx talk, but you sort of never really get to do it because it's too like I was saying before it's too difficult you don't know what to do you know and I sort of looked into it and I thought oh I'm 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 putting myself on a pedestal here by putting a submission in I don't know anybody who would submit an application for me and then the opportunity came up to work with a um speaking mentor Elaine Powell if you look her up I'm not being paid for that Elaine Powell (laughs) and I heard and she just she she popped up in my Facebook feed and I'd met her she's a British lady and I'd met her at some networking years before not long after when Dad Became Joan had been written and she wasn't doing TEDx talk then she was just sort of talking about how to speak better Anyway, she came up in my feed and it says, TEDx, on TEDx, you know, have a call with me. I thought, oh, this is a sign. (laughs) Right. Okay. I see you believe in signs. Okay. I got you. So I booked a conversation with her and we had a long chat and we sort of discussed what it is that I perhaps wanted to talk about. Mm Mm-hmm. And she said to me, you know, you might not think it, but I don't accept anybody onto my program. Wow, that says a lot. So, and it was a lot of money. So in the end, I went on the program and it was hard because even though I had taken myself through all of these processes, coaching myself, Mm-hmm. No, writing my book, learning about myself, she was taking me through that process again. Wow, and you said to her, and you said uh, to me that you became a life coach to coach yourself. So in a way, she yes. almost said, <laughs> "Let's just go through boot camp again." You're like, "Uh, well, I did it, so <laughs> I don't want to." Anyway, so she was absolutely fabulous, and she helped with the application you know talked you through it um went through making sure that it you were going to get on that TEDx stage Mm -hmm. and I got accepted for Wolverhampton on children of transgender parents need support too yes 
So it was following on this message of, yes, there's a lot of conversation about transgender. Um, yes, the person going through the transgender is vitally important, but what about everybody else? Because of all the breakdown in relationships, the separations, people <clears throat> losing their jobs, you know, and it's about relationships in general and how can we keep family together even when a massive change like this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I got it accepted, so then I had to write my speech. And the it was from the date I'd been accepted to the date of standing on that stage was three months. Wow. So I had to I had to write my speech to a set time, learn it off by heart, and then learn how to act it out to be convincing. You, you and I, I've complimented you a lot, and that's because uh, I'm an honest person when it comes to things that I see and experience. You are an amazing storyteller, an amazing storyteller, because I listened to it. I think it was a 12 minute segment, and I yeah. sat there. And cried. I don't really cry because crying is hard to do. It's not because I'm holding it back. It's just hard for me to do. But the delivery was so powerful that I can remember your message clearly through the conviction of your storytelling. And so kudos to you. You did an amazing job. Um, so what I'd like you to do, this is a little bit of homework for you, okay. is to listen to it again. Okay. Because they, I was standing there waiting to go on stage and the presenter said, what, something like this, I can't remember the exact words. Mm -hmm. What if something, what if somebody told you something that you never in your wildest dreams expected to be told? You're right. And I'm going to introduce you to Kath Lloyd. And she was, and, and um, you know, her dad took her by surprise by, by announcing that he was going to change gender. And I hmm. stood there and all of this emotion rose up. Oh, my, my God. Oh, my tears God. Before I'd even got on the stage. Wow. Because. I had said it, I had written about it, I had thought about it, but I had never heard somebody else say it. Mm. And so about a minute or two in, you hear me falter. And that's the emotion coming through. No, I felt it. I finished. I, felt it. I finished it. I, re I, remember, I remember that falter too. And, but it was a falter. It was almost like a, you know, when you're um, barbecuing and you either have the coals that already have infused uh, lighter stuff in it and you light it. But that was like an igniter for what you didn't expect was going to be the flame within you because that message got across to me. And I, again, don't cry. And we're talking about, we're not talking about a change of scenery. We're talking about a gender change. And our society, as we know it, is still young in our understanding of the LBPQ plus community. I, I'm going to get that wrong. Forgive me to all those in, uh, in the community. But it is vital that you didn't have anyone to talk to about it. And you're young, and if no one's talking about it, that was what kept the pain. So it wasn't your fault in any way. Our society shuns us from talking about things that are people's realities. So in that moment is almost your chance to talk about it. And that was an igniter. So, I mean, being a person... Uh, not I want I, I don't never like to use the word victim when it comes to something like that because person who's 
transgender is not that because they chose to, today to change wardrobe. It was there. It's been there. It's a it's a coming out when it should have been a always been thing. What is that world like now for you today now that you understand Joan and dad and being a part of that the transgender community and helping children um, with parents that are making that transition? Um, I mean, it's, it's amazing <laughs> because, uh, and this is where, you know, mentoring comes in. Yes, I'm, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a life coach, a resilience coach, but also to people who are, who are trying to work their through their way through gender change for families wanting to, needing to work their way through a spinal cord injury i'm a mentor because i've been there and i felt it and you know i've had to battle my way through it but it's about guiding them and knowing that they can come through it right if if they want to come through it and this is the thing isn't it it's about wanting to make it different mm -hmm. wanting to make it better wanting life you know to, to wake up and see the sunshine again mm -hmm. and and then it's about putting things in place we're going back through the conversation again putting things in place to make that happen for you right and so that you know, there, there is a better opportunity for those families to stay together, to stay well connected, just like my family did. You know, my mum didn't like the transition, but she dug deep. You could say that she was too frightened to leave. Mm -hmm. I see it that she dug deep. She reconnected with her values and why she married my dad that's powerful i'm gonna pause you for a second reconnected with not religious personal values and standards that's the same reason why i was a determinator i'm gonna figure out my spouse because i love them i don't know what's going on so that your mom you know evoke the inner determination and reconnect with her values that's extremely vital in order to embrace because like you said what we're talking about here is the latter side the ones who are experiencing the pain or bereavement of the change versus the person who's experiencing not being able to be themselves so it's a double self-honesty thing here and a self-honesty with the with the person who's experiencing a complete gender you know identity not i don't even because it's not a crisis it's really not it's it's it, it's a it's a it's a acceptance it's an acceptance of who you are but then there's the person who understood you as your as the person this whole time and that's a whole nother level of bereavement so that's right they're, they're both extremely important but in this segment, we're talking about those who are on the other side of it, experiencing the bereavement of the change. And that is a difficult change to really walk around because it's, it's happening. You can't stop it at all. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, yes, you know, my mom decided to stay mm -hmm. in the relationship, but as companions, as friends. You know, Joan would have liked it different, but this is where the compromise is, isn't it? Right. That Joan was becoming who she really was, mm -hmm. that she had, you know, from from a small boy had realized that he wasn't who he should be, but he'd still got the companionship of my mum. Mm -hmm. But you know, all of the time, if we gain something different, we're going to lose something at the same time. And it's about being willing to accept that comparison, you know, and this is why it's understanding your values so well, isn't it? Because if you're in a job that you hate, 
what what values are helping you stay in that job or what values of yours are going to help you move away from that job you know you talked about your your separation with your wife it was about you know you and your wife coming to terms with what your values are right you could handle together and what you could handle separately and how that was going to benefit both of you right on the money of you as a family to Mm -hmm. live well as a family right and that's that's exactly it's it's you know again going back to that self um diving in it's diving into yourself then coming back to the diving board and then diving together with a shared values of what's happening now because we're, we live in a very dynamic uh universe things that are the only static is the pureness of where everything started but after that is nothing but dynamic change if you're you're expecting someone to be the same person tomorrow that's a that's a sad thing sad place to be because you get left on the train of uncertainty which is fine but it's not fine because no one wants to be uncertain but if you're embracing dynamic change then uncertain is pretty much like being on the train and seeing you know you're in the forest now you're looking at ocean now you're looking at snow now you're just going through these different scene changes but you're embracing the fact that things will change and i think yeah reassessing um uh, or revisiting your values which means you have to have had them in the first place because yeah. if you didn't even have values and we do no matter how basic they are there are values that we go by every day oh yeah yeah to interact yeah, definitely yeah I mean, I, I just want to add that, you know, sometimes you can't change things, you know, say in a relationship that where your life is in danger, for example, because, oh, you know, right. I just want to push this out there that yeah, no. to keep you safe right. or to keep somebody very close to you safe, you may have to leave. Yeah, that's a very important. That's yeah. a very different situation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very different situation. And that's a very important thing to make because people will be like, well, what if I don't want to stay? That's the deciding of, that's the also that diving within. If you know yourself, if you begin to know yourself enough, you will know when this revisiting your values will cause you to want to stay or cause you to respect yourself enough yes. to maintain your values and bring it and see these values in someone else that's going to respect your values. Yes. It's, yes. it's, a, it's, it's, it's a level of acceptance on all parts. I re- I accept that this person is changing. I respect them. So I'm going to continue to be with them with this change and uphold them. And I'm going to, we're going to do the same. Or I want them to change. I don't like this. And you can either falter and buckle and be like, fine, I'm so comfortable in this position. I don't want to leave. But that's also a responsibility and accountability thing too. You're accountable to your life being on the on the downpour because you're 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 staying, you know. Um, and and this yeah. is about your, your boundaries as well. Understanding your personal boundaries, what you're willing to put up with, <laughs> and what you're not willing to put up with. Exactly. You know, and what's the gray area? What's going to change that? Right. You know, really important, and that goes hand in hand with your values, knowing your values. Well, we talk about a megaton of things that <laughs> should shake, and you know, it should really shake people to the core of who they are and why they're doing it. Let's check in with you. I, you know, you you're the resilience. You know, Ted. Uh, I, again, I always say Ted. I guess Ted. TEDx. What, where are you right now in your present moment with your, your life trajectory, just in this very present moment and how you, just kind of how you see yourself moving forward and how you got to make changes? Because I think people look at, you know, motivational speakers as gods that are unshakable and unmovable. But you're, you you pinch yourself and you go out just like everybody else. So, so where are yeah, you Yeah, it's a million. You know, you're going to have rows. 
with your spouse and your kid and it's accepting that that's the way relationships rock and roll you know and you have to make strong decisions so you know me and my husband we're we're moving from England up to Scotland you know and it was a big decision for us <laughs> you know because my, my son is in Scotland um so that is five hour traveling time mm -hmm. and our daughter is on the east coast of England who's well settled with her boyfriend and his family we've got no reason to stay where we are but we didn't want to be far away from both our children okay so it was like who are we going to be near well oh, wow you know, the favorite thing <laughs> My favorite or our, my other favorite? <laughs> our, and it's not favoritism that we feel no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> over our but it's a case of what is going to be best in the long term. You know, our son lives on his own with his carers. He's got his friends where versus our daughter is with her boyfriend, her house, his family who like her and she likes them very important so who needs the most help got you got you well our son needs the most help right he needs the most support right for long term right. know, the rest of his life the rest of our life yeah we've got we have got to give him the best support that we can give him um, and so that's a more recent big decision. It doesn't mean to say that I don't get emotional about it. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving my home where I gave birth to my children. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving, you know, only four miles away. I'm leaving my late parents' home, which was my childhood home. I'm, I'm leaving a lot behind to go right. and start a new life in in edinburgh but for me it's about making life the best that i can for the majority of us yeah and quality of life quality of life mm. i can walk my dogs in edinburgh i can do my breathing in edinburgh i can go to the swimming pool in edinburgh you know I it all sounds like meditative in stuff. Edinburgh. <laughs> Just in edinburgh i can still talk to you guys from edinburgh yes you know and it's about continuing my journey to support other people the best that i can do it through my social media through my books through my little shorty videos being as creative as i can to get the information across as to how i can help other people and continuing to help myself so that i can be as healthy mentally and physically that i can for as long as i can yeah which is the filling your cup part that's why i think it's very vital like you said um before that when you were there in the moment, they didn't ask, you know, how's the mom? Oh, hang on. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Right. Sorry. No, it's okay. The, in the corner under the thing. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. He's cooking, starting to cook the tea. <laughs> no, no, point out. Ah, I'm missing the tea. <laughs> that, that's, I, I love uh, the English and British accent so much. I almost feel like I, I, because my my name Kendrick is actually when I looked it up, it's actually of Welsh descent. So I was like, I was like, oh, I must be. There's some foundational stuff that I need to address here. But um, that is amazing. Uh, the the time that we spent has been amazing. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Leaning up to it, I was like, you know, that every moment you have, especially when you start to meditate and start to understand, you could almost precede the lesson and start feeling how this lesson is going to impact, but you can never prepare exactly how it's going to affect you. But this has been very powerful for me because the question I've always been asking in rehabilitation is what about that moment? 
when I want to be, com be complaining about the stuff because I deserve to at this point in time because I've been keeping it pushing my whole life. But it's not about what, you know, what I get to do or don't get to do. It's about just letting go and just being me. So I'm going to end this with breathwork and meditation um, so we can bring it all down. You can get prepared for your tea and crumpets. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Yeah. So we're going to do the, uh, we, we, I don't have to really guide you at this point. So we're going to do an inhale. Close our eyes. Out through the mouth. Another in through the nose. Out through the mouth. And we'll do two, two rounds of, of breath work um, so we can recharge the brain from the talking. So we're going to start in five, four, three, two, one, and through the mouth. <sighs> Last one. In the hole at the bottom. We're going to breathe into the nose in five, four, three, two, one. And hold. You're going to relax all the talking muscles, all the muscles of anxiety, anticipation. Just relax all those muscles. And if you can, take a few more sips of breath. We're going to own the breath in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. We're going to get right into the second one. In five, four, Three, two, one, and through the mouth. This last one, all you got. Last one. Out to the mouth and hold. We're going to breathe into the nose in five, four, three, two, one. Shh. Hold it. And try to relax any last muscles that you feel that are tensing up. Scan your whole body from the feet to the knees, to the hips, to the abdomen to the chest, to the throat, to the face, and just completely drop your shoulders. And if you can, breathe in a couple more breaths. <sighs> And 
We're going to exhale the breath with an OM in five, four, three, two, one. Oh. And through the nose. Out through the mouth. And we can just take all that exhaling of negative energy that's been caught up in our bodies and just drop any more last tense muscles. Just take a minute to just let that settle and meditate. If you're out there in the world, this meditation is a Ben Holt meditation and on YouTube. I'll include that on the link. Also, it's also known as Wim Hof breathing or fire breathing. This breathing is a breathing that helps us bring oxygen back to our bodies when we've been inundated with all this negative energy, it helps us think. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes back up to the outer experience and have tea and crumpets. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed that um, segment. I absolutely adored and enjoyed it. Um, I love talking about mental health. I'm a complete neuro nerd. And it's not even because I thought I always was. It's because I, I had changed into the point where I'm determined to understand myself and my family. And again, I also want to walk in the shoes of writing a book and you know, hope to be on a, a TEDx one day. Because um, I believe my mission in the world is to raise the vibration of the earth by um, helping people get to know themselves from the inside out. And that doesn't always mean, oh, we got to go write a book. It just means you just know yourself better. So when you're in circumstances, you know how to implement a Kath Lloyd um, uh, seven, not seven habits. Was it seven uh, seven steps. Seven steps. You and you know more. I was about to do a <laughs> Stephen Covey Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, <laughs> but uh, she she has a book when Dad became Joan and Four Steps to Emotional Freedom. You can also catch her TED uh, TEDx talk, um, and I'll catch that in the links below and. Thank you, Kath Lloyd, for gracing us with your presence over there in England. And uh, please like, follow, and where if uh, any other social media outlets you want to plug, please feel free um, so the audience and listeners can. Well, you. first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you, Kendrick. It's been a real pleasure and an honor right. to talk with you today and talk right. about so many different things. So, yes, um, you can find me on my website, which is very simply pathloid.co.uk. I am on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn. So go and take and have a look. You will, if you go onto my website, you'll find the links anyway. But please connect. And if you've got any questions, then pop them in the chat um, and I'm sure Kendrick will answer them or signpost me to Grammaculous Cab. Um, and so it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. And I don't want to disappoint you, but I don't like drinking tea. <laughs>
Well, you know what? I I I, I love tea. I haven't had it now. Um, I my uh, former spouse was um, Kenyan, and they had tea with the uh, milk, and all, it was a whole. I was like, wow, this thing is really good. Um, but anyways, thank you for coming on to 2400 Block. Please follow, like, subscribe, and this is a safe space, and you should always be in a safe space. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks for checking out this episode of 2400 Block Podcast. Don't forget to follow and subscribe.